I was going to make this a one lesson, but when I started to put it all together, I didn't want to pass this over too quickly. I didn't want to just put it in a lesson, tell you about it, and try and cram all that material in one lesson. Um, because when it comes to our inheritance, there's a lot of misconception, and there's a lot to it that we don't understand. And I didn't want to just try and get the highlights, give them to you, and be done. So I broke this into two parts because it deserves, it deserves more than two lessons. And later on, there will actually be a series on this where we may have four or five lessons. Um, but this is critical to identity, is your inheritance. It's, it's critical because we all have callings. We all have ministries, we all have things, we all have a destiny, we all have purpose God wants us to fulfill. However, it is not up to God whether that's going to get done or not. It's up to you. He's put it in you, said this is what I've called you to do, now go do it. He's not going to do it for you. And that's why our identity is so critical because when we know who we are, we understand what we're called to do and what we're supposed to be doing. And we're no longer abusing our lives because we have no purpose. So this is how God works. God shows us a picture. Could be a big picture sometimes. Could be a very small picture. He shows us a picture and he says, look, here's the picture. Now it's your turn to go build it. Here's the instructions. You go build it. We can see that in the Bible. God showed Noah... Here's an ark, but you've got to build it, Noah. I'm not going to build it for you. God showed Moses a tabernacle. Moses, this is what I want. I showed you a picture. Now go build it. God will show you who you are, and then it's up to you to go back and build what he showed you. If God showed you a ministering or a calling and if he showed you something in your life, maybe, uh, maybe something that you're passionate about, you know, your passions are very critical to who you are because not everybody has the same passions. Um, you know, what makes you sad is a sign of something inside of you. What angers you? When you hear something, what gets you upset? That, that is a driving force to you need to understand, you need to recognize, okay, Whenever this happens, this makes me angry. That is a key element to say you are there to change something because it bothers you, right? If, if you just absolutely hate seeing single parents, moms with children, and that, that just makes you so frustrated, that, that is a calling on your life because you have a passion for that and you are called to do something about don't don't pass over things like that don't pass over things where if something makes you sad and you hear about it that's inside of you and it's calling a purpose out in you so don't take those lightly and that builds us that that brings a question is if you have these and you have this maybe a ministry that God's called you or calling or whatever it is, are you preparing yourself? Are you getting your character ready? Are you cultivating yourself and getting ready for that season of your life? Because that season probably won't come until you're ready. And if it does, you'll fail at it miserably. So, we're talking about inheritance, right? Inheritance is not the same as harvest. We need to understand that. Harvest is the result of something you did. There was an action, a gift, a word, something you did. You planted something, therefore you are getting a harvest back from it. And inheritance it doesn't work like that. Inheritance is all about who you are. All you must do for an inheritance is be. That's it. For an inheritance, that's all you got to do. You just have to be. 
inheritance goes to who bear the name of the one who holds it. They get it because of the bloodline. They get it because they're in that family of who their family is and what that family did. And because they're part of that family, they're heir to that inheritance. So we briefly talked last lesson about God colonizing earth. And he wanted to make many sons. And because of the law God set forth, God had to sow something to reap something. That's a law that God put in motion. If you want to harvest, you have to sow. So God, operating by his own laws, sows himself, Jesus, the only begotten son, to set in forth that law. Therefore, he will raise many of us up in sons. Now, here's one problem with inheritance. Is inheritance isn't the same as today as it was in the biblical culture. In the, the roots pop is the same, but how it goes about is completely different. In Jewish culture of the day, only males were eligible for part of the family inheritance. When the Bible talks about sons, referring to the sons of God, right, that is not singling out males. We must understand that this is not... Male versus female. Okay, remember, kingdom, kingdom, God's kingdom, there is no male or female, Galatians 3 and 8. There's no bond nor Greek, slave, or, there's, there's none of that in the kingdom. Okay, when it talks about sons, it is referring to position we have in God. Okay, it's talking about your position you have. So what? We are all one in Christ, right? We're all spiritual offspring of Abraham, and we're equally heirs to God and God's inheritance. Now here's the confusion that the church has talked about our inheritance, is we have confused what, inheritance, what an inheritance is. We often have taught, and we think that inheritance is the same as harvest, and we see the word inheritance like we see the kingdom of God in heaven and we think it has something to do with the afterlife. We think when it's when we walk on a street of gold and we see gates of pearl and we have been taught that, okay, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, that's afterlife. Our inheritance, that's afterlife, but it's not referring to afterlife. It's not referring to paradise. And that misconception has happened, it, it really has, and, and we have taught things, and we refer to things, and it's not quite right, but we don't know any better. So we have this concept of the kingdom, and the church has taught, well, we just got to suffer through until the second coming, and we just got to pray Jesus comes, and we just got to keep on trucking. And then one day he'll take us away, but th that's not what the Bible talks about. That's not what Jesus talked about. And because of this mentality the church has done, we have given place to the world by just, we just got to get by. So we let the world do what they want to do. We let the world take it over because we have the mindset of, well, we just got to suffer through it until Jesus comes. So therefore, we've given everything up to the world because we didn't know that we're supposed to possess everything that the world has. So we've given it all up because we're just thinking, well, I'll get everything when I get to heaven. That's not what the Bible talks about. And Jesus is not... The plan that he had was not just to get you a ticket to heaven. We've talked about that. There's more to Jesus than salvation. And in fact, we think that we're just waiting on God and we're just waiting, waiting on the rapture and we're going to leave this place, but we can see in Revelation that God actually creates a new heaven and new earth. So it's not God is trying to get us to leave this place. He just he created it and now, oh, you know what? I don't like that place and I want to get rid of it. That's not the mentality God set forth. And we think that we inherit, we think our inheritance 
is the next life. That's what, we, that's what we've taught and that's what we think, but the Bible doesn't state that. That's not what the Bible talks about with your inheritance. Your inheritance is not a state. It's not a place. The Bible doesn't talk that it's a place. The Bible doesn't say that it's for you. There's an inheritance God has in you while living on this earth. It's not an afterlife. It's in you. I got scripture, don't worry. He has this for you. He has this for earth. And he wants to extend his rule. He wants to get dominion back into earth through his people. Not just vacate it completely and wipe it off the face of the map. That's not the intentions of God. He wants to bring forth his kingdom here and have us operate the way heaven operates. He wants us to rule it. He wants us to dictate what the world does. And he wants the world to have to come to the church to say, is this okay? Because we have such authority and power in this. That's what we're supposed to do. So that raises a question. What is the inheritance? What is it? Well, an inheritance is a prearranged blessing that will be released at a specific time of maturity. So, first verse, Sister Donna, Ephesians 1 and 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Verse 18. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance... What is that word? The saints. In the saints. Not for the saints. In the saints. Now, when we read this verse, there's a challenge here, if you don't know it, if you didn't see that challenge. And that challenge is, are you going to be able to see it? Can you operate on the level God has destined you to be? Do you have the mentality, do you have the mindset to be up here even though you're here? Can you see what God has planned for you? Can you see yourself how God truly sees you? And then we see that we've seen that it's in the saints. Not for the saints. In the saints. Galatians 4 9, Sister Donna. My little children of whom I travail in birth again unto Christ, be formed, Christ, the anointing, be formed in you. Now, I'm not dismissing heaven. Heaven's a very real place. Paradise, I should say. We're all going there one day. But heaven, paradise, is your reward for the saints. Matthew 5 and 12, there, where you could get that. Paradise, heaven, is your reward, not your inheritance. Your inheritance is inside of you waiting. So we must have our eyes enlightened of His understanding. Why? So we know what the calling is. Now, here is a problem, right? We're talking about inheritance, right? So, we get to get over here on our little handy-dandy board, right? And we're talking about inheritance. Right? And what is it? It's in you, right? In you. Not for you, in you. Then, Sister Donna, go ahead and take me to Galatians 4 and 1. We have this scripture and we have a child, right? Child. Now I say that the heir, heir, receives the inheritance. 
So if you're an heir, you're getting an inheritance, okay? Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant. That could also be slave. Though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So we have this word child. So we need to understand what that word child means. So we need to go to the Greek, and we need to know what that child means. We need to know what it means. And it says, that Greek word in there is nepios. Okay? Nepios. And I will get you guys notes. Don't worry, Brother Ron. Nepios. Right? That's the Greek word in that scripture. Nepios. Now that word means an infant, a simple-minded or immature person, or an unlearned and unenlightened person. So we can really put that a child, nepios, is just immature, right? We'll just, we'll just make that one word. So Sister Donna, go ahead and put that scripture back up there. So now I say that heir, as long as he is immature, okay, that's what, that's what that word's meaning, immature, differeth nothing from a servant or a slave. And what did we talk about what a slave is? A slave is always working, always working and always working and never resting in what he knows is true. Right? And then we get, though he be Lord of all. Right? Now, that right there is a state of being. Because it's saying that this child is Lord over all. But he's immature. He, he, he can't achieve what is destined for him. So we are what? We are a God kind, right? If you're a new creature, you are a God kind. God created you in his image. You are not mankind no more once you're born again. You are a kind of God under him. You have been created before knowledge with a destiny and purpose in place. By the Almighty God in His, Im in His image. So we all have prearranged blessings in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 and 3. Waiting, and these things are waiting for us to get to a certain level of maturity. Now you will not be able to get that prearranged blessing if you act like a nepios, a child, or if you're immature. You don't get those blessings. Because they only come with a certain level of maturity. Even though they're yours to possess, even though you're heir to it, because you're too immature, you don't get them. So I have to give us a challenge, as I always like to do, because we need to be challenged. Maybe you have not received that blessing or blessings or whatever it may be, because you're not mature enough to receive it. Because everything's ready for us. We're heir to it all, but it's not been released to us. And then you have to question, why? Do you act like a child? Do you act immature? Or do you act like you know who your daddy is and everything he has is yours? Now the second part of that, Galatians 4 and 12, is but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Now this is interesting because this tells us that your inheritance is in you, but it takes someone else to unlock it for you. It requires for you to get under what, Pastor? Authority. Getting under some oil, getting under some anointing, and that authority or tutors and governors will cultivate your inheritance inside of you. So that raises another question. What voices are you listening to? If you're not under authority, then you should never expect to receive your inheritance. It is only when you serve 
the thing that God has put over you, you can begin to get to a higher level. Because remember, God works in reverse than how man thinks. So your inheritance is inside you, but it takes some authority to cultivate it inside of you and unlock it. So if you want some inheritance, then you better get under something. And it better be under some godly authority. Now here's the thing, because we think authority, we kind of... We kind of throw authority and, well, I'm under authority, you know, I'm under my pastor, but just because you amen the preacher doesn't mean you're under authority. Just because you come into church, you listen, you give your amen when he wants it, when you give, when you give at the time appointed for tithe and offering, that, that has nothing to do with being under authority. You can do all those things and still not be under any oil. Just because you clap and amen when it sounds good does not mean you're obeying any authority. So don't confuse on you just coming in here, doing what's expected means, yeah, I'm under pastor's authority. You're really not. Those are just rituals that you're performing. That don't mean anything when it comes to authority and are you under that anointing? See, God tests how great you can become by the service you give and how diligently you give it. God tests how great you can become by the service you give and how diligently it is given. Can you stay a little bit longer to help with potluck cleanup? Can you arrive a little bit early just to help set up tables? Can you make sure that the church leaders and, and the church itself isn't being belittled by outside parties? Are you standing up for it? Can you pick that piece of paper up without getting a compliment? Can you serve without letting your emotions and feelings get offended because someone said something that you didn't like? Now these are very surface level things, but let's get a little bit deeper because I like to poke at you guys and challenge you guys. So let's get deeper with that. If you're under some authority, if, if you're going above just performing. When it's 10.30 prayer time, do you have to pray? Can you pray without someone grabbing a microphone? Notice how silenced it got. Do you have to have someone get a microphone and pray? Can you give honor and authority when no one is doing it? Can you say, you know what, you can choose to do that, but I'm not going to. Can you do it on your good days as well as your bad days? Can you be the one who stands behind the curtain and never get any recognition? Are you doing it to please people or to please God? Is God's love radiating, radiating from you with everything that you do? Colossians 3, 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that, the, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. You serve the anointing. The anointing goes beyond just pastor. And when you serve that anointing, that is maturity getting built up inside of you for that inheritance to come into your life. Ephesians 1 and 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Verse 12. That we should not do, be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. We should be. There's that be again. We talked about it a couple lessons ago. Right? If you can change the be, the do comes. If you could just be, you will do. 
So stop trying to do the thing and just be the thing. Now, the word praise means to acknowledge an accommodation, right? Or express the approval or admiration of someone or something. Now, glory was a very tricky word when the translators were putting it into English. It was a very tricky word because the translators could not properly define the word. And it's often translated to praise or honor in our Bible. It's what often glory is. That was the best thing that they had is praise and honor. Now, but glory has another meaning, though. And it means likeness and resemblance. So glory can mean praise and honor, but glory also means likeness and resemblance. Let me show you. The Bible says that the glory of the Lord, that is referring to a likeness and resemblance. Are you resembling the Lord? Are you showing a likeness about the Lord? We can see this definition working in 1 Corinthians 11 when we read, when women, a woman is the glory of a man. And is a man the glory of God? That's resemblance and likeness. You should be able to look at my wife and see what kind of man I am. Then you should be able to look at me and see what kind of God I serve. Is she resembling me? Am I resembling God? That's what that glory is referring to, resemblance and likeness. So, Ephesians 1 and 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his image or his likeness in who we first trusted in the anointing. So, are you reflecting and being an image bearer of God? When we show up, God shows up. When you go and visit, God is visiting. When this church is empty, right, you don't say, well, I'm ready to get to church to, to feel God. No, you feel God when you walk in here because God's inside of you. God's not inside the walls. God only comes when you come. He's inside of you. So when you go and pray for that person, God is with you. When you go and visit that person, you are an image bearer of God. When you show up, God should be showing up as well. So when that is part of your inheritance, your inheritance is being a reflection and resemblance of God. Now, just like Jesus, we should be walking, talking, and acting like Jesus. People should be able to look at the church and see what God is like. The church should be the standard and when the world's in chaos, the world should be able to turn, look at the church, and see the image of God. Unfortunately, they don't. They see standards. They see religiosity. They see judgmentalism. They see all these things, so they discount the church because of what the church has done. So why look at the church for guidance when they don't even know who they are? Why am I going to go to a church when they don't even know who they are. How are they going to help me? That's what your world thinks. That's how they think. That's why they don't come to the church. Because they, they think, well, they're just as messed up as I am. How are they going to help me? They're not, they're not representing a God any more than I am. I have good morals. They have good morals. What, because they dress differently? People at your job should be able to look at you and see a loving, merciful, and gracious God. Now here's what's interesting. is Whenever Samuel heard the voice of God, he went to his mentor Eli. Three times, Samuel, God called out to Samuel. Samuel wakes up and goes to his mentor Eli. 
And that amazes me because anytime you speak, it should sound like your heavenly father. The voices in your life should sound like God talking to you. So that tells me that when God speaks to us, because God's voice sounded like his mentor, that tells me that we should be listening to our mentors because God uses their voice to speak into our life. Your actions should show grace and mercy. That's part of your inheritance. Heaven is not your inheritance. Inheritance is the ability to resemble. Now, you only get that with maturity. You don't just get that. If you are entitled to an inheritance, you are the heir to something. You are getting something from a previous generation if you're an heir to an inheritance. The Bible states that we are joint heirs to Jesus. Whatever God did manifest in Jesus is for us. Because whatever Jesus did, because we're joint heirs to Him, we are to do also. Now, God does not work with age. It's not how God does maturity. He doesn't say, okay, when you hit age 60, you're now mature. That's not how He works. He works with seasons of your life. We often throw the children of God. Now, here's some, here's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you guys, okay? You ready for this? We often, res, we often throw children of God and sons of God into one bucket. However, the Bible states there's a difference between the children of God and sons of God. Okay? So... We have this child, Nepios, that's immature. There's another child definition in the Greek. Okay? Because the Greek is very complex. So we have another definition. And that definition, this child, is when it refers to children of God. A child of God, okay? That's what this definition is going to be. Alright? So when we hear the children of God, right, according to Romans 8 and 16, Sister Donna, This is the definition of what a child of God is. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. These are the children of God. That's the definition. Okay, so we know that the children of God have the Holy Ghost, God's Spirit, whatever you want to call it, living on the inside of them. But this word, this word is technon. Okay? Technon. Now, that Greek word means someone who lives in full dependency of the Father. Full dependency. That's what this word means. You live in full dependency of the Father. And it can also mean that there's no maturity in you. So then we get to Romans 8.14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So now we have two different definitions. Notice the sons of God don't just have the Spirit inside them, but they're led by the Spirit inside of them. So the children of God just possess the Spirit. They have the Holy Ghost. They've done what we tell everybody to do. That's the children of God. They're they're fully dependent on God to provide for them. They're fully dependent and they have no maturity about them. But then there's this word son. Now that word son is huyos. Huyos. Okay? That is the Greek word. Huyos. Now, huyos, that word means that child, that technon, has now matured enough to become a son. He is now resembling the likeness and resemblance of his father. And because he's mature enough and representing his father 
and being an image bearer of his father, he is now ready for the inheritance. So there's a difference here. There's a difference between a child of God and a son of God. If you're a son of God, that means you are representing, that means you are being an image bearer to your father, and you are mature enough to receive that inheritance. So are you mature enough, becomes the question. Are you a child of God, or have you matured to be a son of God? Romans 8, 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of not the children of God, because they're too immature, but the, they're waiting for the huos. They're waiting for the mature sons of God. They're waiting for the ones who know who they are, represent their God, and are ready to take over the world. We know earth was made subject because of dominion was lost. That's why we have hurricanes. That's, that's why we have all this, because the earth groaneth in pains because dominion was lost and now it operates with no dominion. Or what dominion it is operating in is wicked and it doesn't like it. The kingdom does not come to the casual Christian. We've talked about getting the kingdom. You don't just get the kingdom. You have to seek for the kingdom. So we started off, we all started off as a child of God. A child of God is just someone who kind of goes through the motions. They're, they're a casual Christian. They got the Holy Ghost. They, they come in. They do their thing. They live their life with good morals, and they try to be a good person. They try to obey the commandments. They, 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 they try to do this, right? Being a child of God is not a, necessarily a bad thing. We all were there at one point. Maybe some of us are still there. We're just coming in, performing. We're... But there's a people that go beyond just a childlike tendency. Right? And, and these children have never been developed and they never strive to be more than just, we love this word, pew warmers. We ain't heard that one in a while. However, God has called everyone to be more than just a technon, a child. He predestined us into sonship God predestined us not to remain his children not to remain in a, an initial infant stage of immaturity but to be mature sons to attain the final stage to, a, to the stage of maturity the stage in which we can receive the inheritance and we start resembling what God resembles but here's the problem. Because there's these people, and the sons of God, they go beyond just performing at bare minimum. They're led by the Spirit. When the Spirit says to give that, and they do it. When the Spirit says, hey, I want you to pray a little bit longer, they do it. When the Spirit wants them to volunteer and give a helping hand, they do it. Those are the sons of God. Those are the ones that wake up every day and say, all right, God, what do you want from me today? What do you need? What do you want to mess up in my life today? That way I can give you the glory and the honor you deserve. What can I do today to bring forth your kingdom to people? Not, oh, God, that's just more of an inconvenience. I, I don't know that. I, then you're, you're not a son of God. You're just a child. You're an immature child who doesn't know who your father really is. You're in full dependency of him, but when God can tell you to do something and you do it, that's a maturity level that you are being led by the Spirit. And we need to remember this because it's not necessarily a bad thing to be a child of God because technically we were all children of God, but... Some of us went beyond a child. and Now we need to remember that the kingdom, we talked about this, we've, we've, the church has taught that the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven is paradise. We've voided that theory. We've gotten that idea out of here. See, but we need to understand that salvation still comes to the children of God. Okay, They're still saved and they still will live their life 
they will still they still have salvation and they still just it's not necessarily a bad thing but the children of god will continue to work the earth with their hands to whereas the sons of god will work the earth with their words see the children will constantly work and work and work and it will never be enough and the pressures and the winds of life will always toss them from here to there but the sons of god have a different level they have a level of maturity where they say, no, I'm in dominion. I'm in authority. You bow to me. You will operate how I tell you to operate in. trying to think how I want to close this up because I still got some stuff, but it'll be less than two. So I'm going to jump to my end point, right? So we've talked about, I'm going to go into it next time, but we've talked about immature and mature, right? Immature and mature. A child or immature or a child or immaturity is defined by the way you speak. By understanding something and by the way you think. An heir, if he's in the state of being of a child, will not receive an inheritance from the father. People can tell by how mature you are by the way you speak. I can listen to you. I can get in a conversation with you. And I can listen to you and get an idea of the condition of your heart. I can listen to the words. I can get a snapshot of what you understand, how you understand it, and the thought process your mind has just by talking to you. So I know that mature, if you're depending on something, if you're mature, you you know what to say. You know what not to say. So I know how mature you are by how you respond to situations and circumstances. How do you respond to that person? Your words, understanding, and your thoughts give away of how mature or immature you are. How do you perceive things? What is your understanding of something? Do you think you're the victim? Do you think you're entitled to everything? Do you think this way about yourself? Do you think that way about yourself? You can listen to your words and truly see how mature someone is. Just by the way they speak, by the way they think about themselves, by the way they think about other people, you can tell by how mature they are. So how do you think about yourself? What thoughts do you entertain? How do you process them? Do you meditate on them and keep them in your mind till your heart agrees and then the issues of life flow out? A child or immature person looks at the things and says, they're mine. That's what a child does. But a son or a mature person sees what God has shown them and they go and work for it till it comes to pass. So I challenge with you that today. How mature are you? How mature are you? How do you think? How do you act? How do you respond? What are your actions? If we were to sit down One day, and I were to watch you, what does your life speak? How do you act? What do you say when no one is around? So I challenge you that today, because we're going to go into this more, I don't think, next Tuesday, I believe, is when I'll be finishing this up. We'll be going more into this, because there's more to it. So I challenge you that today. How mature are you? Only you you probably should maybe think about that. Are you a child of God? Or have you transitioned past that? Past an infant stage? Past just fully dependent on God to say, no, I know God's right there, but I'm going to do some things because He's in me and I don't need Him to do it. I can do it myself because I have the power. I have the authority to do it myself. 